Well, you got me here on Wednesday nights now. And uh, you went through all of the powerful teachers last quarter. All those professors, you went through all of them and they finally said, well, I guess, Logan, you can, you can get up there if you want. So we, uh, asked, I've asked Tim Albright to lead us in a prayer before we get started. So uh, Tim, would you, would you lead us? says on the screen, you, you, I like it. Well, let me just be honest with you. I don't like teaching auditorium classes. Um, because I like it when we're all crammed in the same room, right next to each other, and, and I can see the faces and the hearts of every person real well, and there just feels like so much better. So, as it says on the screen throughout this Wednesday night class, and I'm going to mention it every single Wednesday night. For those of you who are in the back, I will call on you quite a bit more. <laughs> so if, like Taylor, I mean, you're prime target. I'm gonna say, Taylor, give us your explanation of that text, okay? So really, I want you guys to, uh, thank you, BJ. You can't call on me now. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I will say again, you went through all the powerful teachers last quarter, but I'm thankful that I'm in here. I, I really am. This is a great opportunity to be a great text to go through. Uh, I was a campus minister years ago, and I remember somebody called me one time and said, Logan, we need someone to come and preach a gospel meeting. And I'm on the phone, and, and, I, and he said, I knew you would be the one to call. And I said, okay. And he, he says, do you know anyone or are in contact with anyone? <laughs> that would be good to use. <laughs> so, oh, I had to be humble. It's great when other people humble you. I'm not much of a verse by verse person in the exegesis of a text. I don't like to just say, next verse, let's cover that. Next verse, let's cover that. You're going to find in, a, in an auditorium class such as this that I may s decide to kind of go off a little bit and, and say, let's look at a sermon from this, or let's look at um, some application from this text, or uh, there's a chance that we may do that. And I may, I may do verse by verse a little bit, but my direction in this class may be a little bit different than others. My aim is not to teach a class and to stand up at the front and, and say, I have gotten through all the material while you drift away into Neverland and say after I get home, well, I taught. My goal, and I think every teacher's goal, ought to be, in a sense, retention, to try to retain. And if you sit in a classroom um, like the youth, and when I teach the youth, I try to ask repetitive questions. So I might say something like, who wrote the book of Peter? And you would say, exactly. That's why I love an auditorium class. <laughs> so the idea is, I think the more we ask questions, the more we respond, the more we answer, that the more helpful it is to us to learn. Um, so we might pause at a time and, and might, for example, just take a word like the word elect or the word hope or, um, you know, a true meaning of grace. Or we might just take a drift off away and say, wait a second, let's just talk about this and, and not only that, but Peter as well, of course. So. Uh, I don't really, and I, don't, I, I hate to say this, but I don't really care if we get through all of Second Peter. That's the kind of teacher I am. I, I, I think what happens is sometimes people don't make comments if they know the teacher's in a hurry. you agree? 
if the teacher's in a hurry, then you're not going to be like, oh, I want to say something. Uh, and so th those of you who are OCD, that's really going to bother you. Um, I, again, I'm after retention, not necessarily completion. So I do want you to know, this is just a, kind of at the outset, I, I, love, I love comments. I love uh, brief comments, um, especially that have to do with the text and that also that also makes sense through the text. So um, I'm not the only Christian in this room. I'm not the only disciple. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of good teachers in this room. There's a lot of you that have taught Bible classes in different ways. So I, I, I really would applaud anybody saying, hey, I, I just have a point to make on this. I don't like to call people out unless they're on the back row. So let's have fun together. And let's go through First and Second Peter, uh, study a very applicable text that's going to truly benefit us all. Um, today, as we intro to Peter, that's what we're going to do tonight, we're going to start uh, in chapter 1 next Wednesday night and, and sift through some of, those, some of those things in chapter 1, kind of like dragging a net through the text, if you understand. But let's start it off this way. We have a problem. Let's just, and I want you to vision with me, we have a problem. There are a uh, selection of cities or areas in Texas, let's just say, four or five cities or areas that are really suffering in their faith. And some of you might know these people. You know Jeff works in Pottsboro. Maybe, maybe he's associated with people down there in the church. Or maybe you know someone from Pottsboro. Or you, or you maybe Sherman or Denison or Gainesville or Bonham or whatever. And we have this selection of a few cities or areas down there. And you know that as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, they're suffering. They're hurting in different ways. Um, maybe they have a wide range of diversity meaning language or uh, social and ethnic diversity. And um, for the sake of the text, we would, of course, add Jew and Gentile to that. So we need to send a letter to them. We've got to send something that's going to enrich their faith through all the suffering that they've endured and, and, and will continue to endure. And so what kind of letter would we send? We're going to send it in the form of a writing of a letter. Uh, what kind of letter would we send them? They're, they're suffering through all kinds of different things. Anybody? Encouragement. Encouragement. Prayers, hope. Prayers, hope. Anybody else? Love. So if we look at the, the recipients of this letter, uh, well, this is the outline, but we'll go through that here in a second. It appears that they are uh, Jewish and Gentile Christians who scattered across Asia Minor. And I mentioned Texas for an example because we're going to understand more of that. You'll understand here in a second. But the district mentioned in 1 Peter 1 and chapter 1, you, you can look through there where it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout. And you look at this area of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, um, strangers and foreigners. These districts are also mentioned in Acts chapter 2, when the church began. And we know that Peter worked among the Gentiles, and um, chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, 11 are called strangers and foreigners. And their recipients appear to be figures who could be subject to persecution at any time. So this is not to say that they weren't being continuously persecuted. They might have been, but uh, the presence of elders there, we see that. They, were, uh, they needed to learn submission to those elders. Uh, it suggests, as it says on the screen, a maturity in the congregations that Peter is writing to. The people were under elders. And what does the presence of elders say about the church? Anybody? Say that louder. It's growing. Not only that, but what else? There's a leadership there. Uh, and you could go on and on when you start talking about the qualifications of elders. So 
it's possibly a, a speedy development in a sense due to spiritual gifts, maybe having to grow up fast, a mature congregation possibly. If you look at uh, our congregation, we have six elders. Somebody might say, well, they seem like a very mature congregation. They have, I've worked in congregation that didn't have elders. Okay, so um, again, recall those districts in Acts chapter 2 mentioned also, and we know, and I have a map here that shows that. I'll just kind of keep that up there for a little bit, the recipients in that, in that sense, but they were Christians, pilgrims. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as, and there it is again, aliens and strangers. So, as we look at the recipients, and kind of going back to my Texas point, I don't want to confuse you, but let's just say that the gospel has spread into Pottsboro and Bonham and all that, and, and we see the, the growth of the church out there. We would want to send a letter to them in the same way. We hear of maybe a great suffering that's come upon them for different reasons. We want them to be encouraged as you stated. Now, what kind of suffering? Well, maybe it's life-threatening. Maybe it's not life-threatening. But we know they're getting a lot of persecution from uh, governing officials probably, and maybe authorities who were scrutinizing them uh, Christ as Christians. Maybe they were blaming them for uh, misfortunes or crimes that had happened. You just try to imagine the, the suffering that goes on. It, a lot of times when I was younger, I would think about suffering and just think, oh, they were being beaten for being a Christian. Is there a lot more suffering than that? Well, sure. So you, you've kind of got to open that up a little bit. The governing authorities, they might see Christianity as a what? As a threat or a hoax or, or causing all kinds of problems. We see that in the New Testament and other places, but maybe they heard of their family or friends suffering. Maybe they're pressed out of their homes because of, of their suffering, because of their faith. And, and um, maybe, you know, we hear like the five areas in Texas, they're, they're extremely wearing down. This would be not far from us. I mean, there are congregations not far from us now who are wearing down. I was talking to somebody about our youth and how we had 39 at their holiday party in here. We had a great time. 39 7th through 12th graders. And the response was, I wish we had 39 7th through 12th graders. They're, they're, you hear of congregations who are struggling, and this is kind of what this is. I, maybe we've heard of Christians giving up or even getting bitter. Or maybe they weren't living holy lives. Maybe in one area we're totally focused on the intense suffering that they're going through, and that's it. Maybe they saw suffering as a bad ordeal. Um, uh, worst thing ever. And we'll get to that in some of the texts that, he, that Peter writes. But maybe they were barely getting through the pain. And they were confused on some critical matters, some critical issues of faith that they needed direction on. Maybe they had trouble with submission. We'll get to that. Subjection. Anybody here ever question the word submission? I have. What does that mean? A husband to a wife. They had issues. They had struggles with that. They needed help with that. They needed direction with that. So we think of um, what they were suffering under. We learn more historically what they were suffering under. We'll get to that too. Maybe they had an old life that they needed to get rid of. Anybody have an old life they'd like to get rid of? Um, perhaps some struggles with the old law and new law. We get to that as well. But let's get some comments here for a second. What do these Christian brothers and sisters, and I'm going to say this again, and I want you to think even more than just a word if you want, what do they need to hear in the form of a letter? You said encouragement, you said hope, you said love. What else? Say that again. God's promises, okay? And help. And help. Um, what else? Wise counsel. Wise counsel. I was thinking instruction. Good answer. They needed some wise counsel. So you imagine the writer of this book 
For Peter is trying to, to put all of this into a text, into a letter. And what's, what's beautiful about this text is that the way that he does it, it's not just writing a letter. What's beautiful about First and Second Peter is the Greek, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. But they're called to suffer for his name's sake. And, and to think of it more, is suffering all negative? Anybody? No, why, Jimmy? I'm calling you out. Good. So suffering's not all negative. Maybe they saw it as all negative. Um, and maybe their patience and endurance uh, that might, could, well, I'll tell you what, what, if we have patience and we have endurance and we have those who are persecuting us, what might that do to the people persecuting us? Is it possible that we could convert someone's thinking from persecutor to being a Christian just in our actions? So you've got to really add in all this, you know, and, and what else would you add to that? You know, there's a lot more, but... Okay, so let's get to who would you think to be best to write such a letter? Let's just say we've got a group of people here and we're going to send a letter to those cities, those areas that are really suffering. Who would be best to do that? Wouldn't it be great if you could get someone who who knew Jesus, was an eyewitness, and was there when he died and when he rose again. And then, and then, see, that's why I want to kind of back up and look at this for a second. Look at chapter 5 and verse 1, 1 Peter 5, 1. Therefore I exhort the elders among you, and this is, I'm, I'm, I, always, I usually have New American Standard, with me here. So therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ. You see that? Witness the sufferings of Christ. Even better. What else is in that text that Peter is? Not just a witness of the sufferings of Christ. What else is in that verse? He's an elder. What would that say about him? Ron? You don't have, you, do you have any knowledge of elders at all? <laughs> What, what might that say about Peter as an elder? That he was qualified man. And if he's qualified, he's a single man, not married, right? No. So you see, it just takes on it on and on and on. What else? You were going to say something else. Anything else? Well, he's a good Christian. I mean, all of us ought to be. And all of us... Many, many of us ought to be qualified as he was qualified. No, we didn't get to see Jesus come on the cross, but we still, we still see him there through his word. And we need to have all that knowledge. So That's right. Be effective if you want to write a letter to someone. That's right. Or some people. That's right. So, well, I think you did it for you. Unlike some, he wasn't a pope. He was a fellow elder. That's right. He wasn't. Over the That's church. right. He was part of the leadership of the church. He could. That's right. He could relate to these elders and what they're going. Through. That's right. Good point. Um. Well, yeah, Barbara. I think Peter also was one who experienced the persecution of the as they were. That's right. She's saying, I think that he experienced the sufferings as, as they were, and I, and I agree with that. You, you, it wasn't just writing to those suffering. He himself uh, was undergoing suffering. Good point. He's a partaker. Very good. This is great. I love this. Um, even better, wouldn't it be great if you could get someone who was reported to actually swing his legs over the side of a boat and walk on water for just a little while. And I know he sank, but wouldn't it be great? And I can picture Jesus saying to him, and I like to think of him, Jesus smiling as he says this, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? You were doing so good. Kind of like Galatians, who bewitched you? You, know, you were doing so good. 
Why did you doubt? The fact that he sang speaks to me as well. Amen. Okay, so we're getting we're getting somewhere now. I I would love the compliment as John has that the John's compliment um, was he was the beloved disciple. John chapter uh, twenty one verse seven. That would be awesome. But we also, as as she's stating, want someone who is not perfect. Uh, why would we want an, an impetuous? impulsive teacher and or someone to write this letter that's not perfect now okay James that's what we are and uh, so uh, someone that that could relate someone that could be one of the first to immediately uh, leave his nets you remember um, and we, we look at darkness to light or um, heartbreak to hallelujah or brokenness to wholeness that's the message of the text is it not so look in Matthew chapter 4 with me. Turn to Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. And walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And in verse 19b, they said, well, let us think about it for a little while. <laughs> no. In verse 20, they immediately left their nets. We read through that, but that, that's just weird. That just doesn't make sense. But that just shows what kind of person that Peter was. Um, and Andrew. So... This is someone that had a firm grasp on the depth of conviction. He, we, we look at John's gospel, or John the apostle of love. We might say Paul was the apostle of faith. What would you say Peter's the apostle of? Hope. We talked about hope on Sunday. Someone who, like I said, had a firm grasp on, on the depth of conviction, who would jump out of a boat and run to Jesus. Not perfect. <clears throat> But precious. Precious to Jesus in his zeal. Where was, where was Peter present? Where would you say Peter was present at fill in the blank? Peter was present at the transfiguration. Peter, like I said, he was there at the death. He was there at the resurrection. He had some high points, did he not? And he had some low points. Um, a successful fisherman, a disciple of Christ, church elder, an author. Uh, not perfect, again, we say that. He met Jesus like we talked about through his brother's intervention, uh, his brother Andrew's inter intervention, rather, in John 1. The town that he, he was from is Bethsaida which means house of fishing. So he was married, as we talked about. He evidently had a family. We know of his mother-in-law in Matthew, or in Mark chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 4. He calls himself an elder or a bishop or a pastor in that sense. He was not formally educated, as far as we know. Edward, Ed, Everett Ferguson uh, asserted that the ancient Jewish nation was the most University, universally literate in all of antiquity. Flip over to Acts chapter 4 for a minute. I'm talking about the unlearned, you know where I'm headed. Acts chapter 4. And verse 13. Now as they observe the confidence of Peter and John... Which we saw, we've seen that. We've seen his confidence. And understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were marveling. And they began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. The word unlearned there in the Greek, agramatos, associates, is associated with uh, literature in that sense. But Peter was not um, gramatos. He was, and I'm not saying ignorant in a negativity way, but 
um, he was ignorant of a lot of things that other scholars w were not. So Peter, we know he was able to read and write. Um, and he and John amazed the Jewish council there because they were able to confidently, boldly uh, confront those accusations there. That takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of confidence. But would a fisherman, would a fisherman be expected to stand in such company and do that? I, I was thinking recently, I was talking to Matt Mock, and a few times Matt Mock has said the words, I just squeeze fish for a living. That's what he says all the time. I don't know if you've heard him tell it, I just squeeze fish for a living. And uh, every time he says that, I think to myself, so did Peter. <laughs> but it's just the humility of Matt, and that's one of the reasons I love him. But Peter was first to preach the gospel. How, how cool is that? He was... Uh, what, what else stands, stands out to you about Peter? He was first to do a lot of things. Yeah. Cut off Malchus and Peter. Yep. Warm him by the fire when they questioned who he was. That's right. And all and all and Yep, it goes on and on. Head of the line. We have quite a, a history. We're not here wondering about Peter. That's what's great. We have all this material behind us to look at Peter. You look at his, his denial three, three times. You realize that all four writers record his denial. What, what might that suggest? That it was known? And, and I wondered if, if we ever could, could say, you know, about those, the recipients of this letter, wait, wasn't this the guy? And how many times has people probably said that about us? Wait a second. Even my mom? My mom still to this day says, I did not think you would ever become a minister. You were too, and I'm not going to finish that. But. He was one of the three closest apostles to Jesus. Think about that. He was enthusiastic. He was energetic. He was bold, confident, impetuous, impulsive. You could go on and on and on. Um, one of the first witnesses to what? The resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, someone who has a past. What would we say about that? Why doesn't Peter's past completely disqualify? Forgiveness. Grace. He did, he did a foolish thing. He, it was sinful what he did, the night Christ. Yeah. And then we're warned against that, you know, doing that for ourselves. But I often think about him and, and how disappointed Jesus might have been at the moment. And, and I always think about how did he, we don't have a record, how did he get back in the good graces of Christ? Mm -hmm. when, when they met afterwards, how did he approach Jesus? And, and how did Jesus welcome him back? Yeah. He, he overcame a, a big sin. Now, I don't know how that all happened, but I know that he, he humbled himself. He, he had to. And admit his sin. And, and I don't know if he had to ask Christ or he just approached Christ and Christ just open his arms to him. Yeah. Come on. I, I know I know your heart. That's right. Very good. Be my disciple Very good. <laughs> Billy and then Mike. When you really think about it, think of the extreme life experiences that he and then you compare that to the life experiences that we go through today. And there's and the same, same, we have the same issues, we have the same struggles, we have the same results even. So, but the, the extremism that it is, is I mean, it, it just, it just, it's way off the balance here. It is, it's hard. I, I guess that's one, one of my struggles whenever I look at this, it is to think, why in the world am I not doing better? He, 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 
he went through these same struggles, and I mean, I, I stumbled just like he does. But I'm not probably, I didn't experience near what he did. So I should be on Just connected, and one thing Peter always brings up to me in relation to him and I in Christ is to remember how close Jesus and him were in Christ, and he was going to do that all along. And so it's not that you messed up and ruined our relationship. That's right. He knew that was coming, and, and, but uh, uh, not defined by that mistake, but, but how he dealt with it and how he overcame it. As, as, as these guys are talking about Peter's history, doesn't that really truly define grace a little bit better for us? I mean, just the fact that Peter's the one that wrote this, and we, Paul's the same, but here, here's a guy with, with this kind of a past who didn't just say to, about Jesus, well, I'm not sure if I, if, I, if I should say anything about Christ. He denied him three times. And, and here is these po the points these fellows are making. Uh, that says a lot about grace. And, and, and we misunderstand grace a lot. But. Shortly after that, when, uh, when he goes running to the tomb, to the open tomb, yeah. he notices he's gone. Yeah. What's the first thing that he does? That's right. He goes right back to fishing. <laughs> That's when Jesus found him and said, yeah. hey, you guys come in. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk. So powerful. So, how might we start the letter? Dear people? Okay, Christians would be good. What? Dear family. Dear family? But what if, and this is why the Greek is so powerful here, what if we said the word dear sojourners? I mean, the salutation always came first. Peter, an apostle. But what if we said sojourners? What does that convey? Pilgrims passing through for a little while. Temporal. On their way somewhere. Aliens in that sense. To a people suffering, that meant a lot. So before we get into place and authorship, there are a few people who dispute that Peter is the author, but it's pretty difficult to sway that when Peter mentions himself as the author. But uh, the ones who do question it, really question it based on the, the literary work is too good for a Galilean fisherman. That's the thing that I, I read that over and over and over. And, they, and I'm talking about actual articles that I read uh, in, in some of my Freed Hardeman journal places where I can go get really good articles uh, or really bad. But they, they go on and on and on that, that there's no way that a Galilean fisherman could write such good Greek in this way. But when someone, and not only that, but also his life, but I want to say when someone desires the good work of being a follower of Jesus Christ, they truly begin to meet their true potential. And here I look at Peter and I say, how in the world could he go from this to this, and Paul too, but he's meeting his potential. And we've got something for us to remember too. Are we meeting our true potential as Christians? Early sources in church history attribute the letter to Peter. I'm talking about Tertullian, uh, Eusebius, Clement of Alexandria. Um, Peter is mentioned over 70 times in the New Testament. 26 places Simon and Peter occur in the same spot. And a few times he's simply called Simon. We mention he is claiming to be the writer in chapter 1 and verse 1. We mention chapter 5 and verse 1 where he is an elder. But also Polycarp quoted 1 Peter um, in A.D. 130. So from the way Peter writes, you can tell he was an eyewitness to the events of Jesus' life and his death. He doesn't just claim it. You can tell. Um, how many times, we've already talked about how many times we have recall stories about Peter. Which one's most precious to you? That's one of the words in Peter. Which one is most precious to you? Is it denial? What, what, what do you think of when you think of Peter? Right offhand. Anybody? Preacher. Preacher. Um, you might think positive. Some might see his mistakes. But I think of Matthew chapter 16 where Peter, uh, what did he, he, he makes a good confession. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in the same chapter, chapter he was rebuked. 
<laughs> what? So, but what if Peter wasn't a great scribe? What if we wanted to send the letter, but Peter's not just the greatest at Greek, but we needed somebody who truly knew Greek, who could possibly even deliver it, what might we do? Thank you, Rusty. We might hire somebody. Turn to chapter 5 and verse 12, First Peter. That bell always rings quicker than you think. First Peter 5 and verse 12. Rusty, would you read that? Now, Silvanus, the faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. By Silvanus, or Silas, the scribe, or on you meant, on, I never can, amenuensis, Silas was a Jewish Christian, a well-known missionary in the church. And, and Peter is, um, the book of Peter, rather, it is well-known, like I said, for its Greek. And we're not going to get into the Greek really in depth. We will understand some words. But there's a difference in style. Phrases like, um, untouched by death. The, the literary style of some of those words is really powerful. It's like something that, that unstained by evil and other phrases. Um, when did Peter write this epistle? Well, I thought I had that up here on my, let me see. No, I didn't. There's the outline, I'll just keep that up there for a little bit. But it's hard to narrow down the date, but we understand the vicinity based upon things that happen. It was, um, some have said that it's between AD 58 or 64, or at least prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, or destruction of the temple in AD 70. And after the prison epistles, we know 64 to 68. We understand Nero um, ended in, in 68. So uh, we kind of speculate, 63, 64, somewhere in there. And we attribute that to basically by facts. We don't just take a guess. We look at external and internal sources to see when he, he possibly wrote the book. Um, Peter probably died during the reign of Nero. We know that. How did Peter die? Does anybody know? What does history say? What does external sources say? Okay, crucified upside down. That's not just something that we're grabbing out there. That's actually um, in two different external sources that I was reading this morning. They, uh, there's a, in fact, you can visit it today, but they say there's a hole there that you can find but, uh, where it happened. But where was he writing this book from? Anybody? Rome. Babylon, Rome. And so I think some people speculate, well, is this actually Babylon or was it Rome? Or some, some think it's Jerusalem. Some thought all these different writers said this and this and this. Listen, Babylon's mentioned in the text. I take it as it what as it is. I stick with that. I, I believe he was writing from Babylon. The purpose of the letter, flip over to 1 Peter 5, 12, and kind of as we close, we'll look at the, the, the purpose of the letter. It's a great passage. I have written to you briefly, and Rusty's already read this, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Um, conveying a message of hope and encouragement. Um, he's trying to, in a sense, insulate the inner person from the outer struggles that they might have been going through. If we look at the... I'm going to go back to the map just for a second. That's some of the key words, by the way. And, and I don't know why I skipped precious, but I wanted that to be in there. If we look at this map, um, and you, you can, like I said, flip over to Acts chapter 2. And you can see a little bit more from, the, from these locations here. But there is a uh, Pontus over here. Uh, I get mixed. I get turned around. I'm left-handed and, and totally messed up. But Pontus is Greek for sea. And we're talking about the Black Sea, of course. It founded by the Persians and taken over by Greeks later and then the Roman Empire eventually. There's something, There's as we're dragging through this, there's something important through this. Galatia is uh, there's a capital there of Ankara in Galatia and it's of course all this is Turkey but conquered in 25 BC by Augustus Caesar Cappadocia Darius mentions um, and also 
conquered and it was made a Roman province. And Bithynia, which on the west end is Bithynia, on the Pontus is on the east side, founded by Alexander the Great, and uh, the Romans finally took over that. This is who he mentions in the first part. These are the churches that are gathered there. So we're going to stop there. The bell's rung. We're going to continue next Wednesday night. We're going to get right straight into the chapter one. It's exciting stuff, and I hope you can join us. Thank you for all your comments and your time. Got a. Uh special guest with us tonight. Uh, Mike Arnold has been here once before. He's sitting next to JD and I uh, want you all to be sure and make him feel welcome if you would please. There we go. When Paul was uh, talking to people on Mars Hill and Acts chapter 17 he said these words the God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And so, getting some feedback up here, Philip, can you? Thank you. Uh, as he was talking to these philosophers, these in, uh, intellectual people, he was trying to explain to them uh, that God created us. He put us where he wanted us to be. He put boundaries on the countries. He put boundaries on the ocean. He put boundaries on the rivers. Uh, and he said that he did all of these things so that men would perhaps seek him and feel their way toward him and find him. But he assured them that God is actually not far from us. Jesus was asked by a scholar one time, what's the great commandment? You remember what the answer was? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. I've underlined and italicized the word all. When Jesus was explaining this to him, uh, he wanted to be sure that the man understood this is not just a commandment that you memorize. This is not something that you recite. This is something that you do with all of your heart, that you do with all of your soul, you do with all of your mind. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please God for whoever would draw near to him must believe that he exists and what? that he rewards those who seek him. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. First Chronicles, David was giving advice to his son Solomon. He said, You, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart, with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Are you seeing a theme here somewhere? Jeremiah, you will seek me and find me. When? When you seek me with all of your heart. So how do we seek God? And we'll just make this very brief. Number one, we can seek God in nature, and a lot of people do. Uh, Romans 1 says, what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. And so when we go outside 
and we see a beautiful scene or we see a, a sunset or a sunrise, we need to recognize God in that. But that's only so far that nature can take us. Nature can't tell us uh, more about God than his power and his creativity uh, and things of that nature. And so we have to go beyond nature. How do we see God? Well, primarily in his word. He's given us his word so that we can know him. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of Christ, the Bible. Matthew 17, 5, uh, this is the scene of the transfiguration. Jesus is up on a mount with three of his disciples. And while uh, Peter was still speaking, because he didn't know what to do, uh, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed the voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says that God has spoken through the ages in many different ways, through prophets uh, and so on. But now in this last day, he has spoken to us through his son, Jesus, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. What did Jesus say? 1248 of John, he says, The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I've spoken will judge him on the last day. Do you suppose we need to know what that word is? If it's going to judge us. Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So it's imperative that we understand who Jesus is and that we read his word. How do we see God? We also see God in prayer. Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Colossians, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And of course, you know the one, pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. How do we see God? A fourth way, and we'll wrap this up. We see God in godly relationships. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. So what we're doing right now is what God wants us to be doing. He says we need to consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, meeting together. And that's what we're doing. Did you know that God also seeks us? John 4, 23 and 24, Jesus was talking to the woman at the well and he said, the hour is coming and it's now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father seeks such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God's seeking you. The question for us tonight, and this is the end of it, are you seeking God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? You know, we talked about seeking Him in His Word, in prayer, in godly relationships. In the physical world, our relationships with each other, uh, say, Lane, you know, uh, I'm seeking after you. I want to be your best friend. But I don't have time to read the mail that you sent me. Uh, if you send me a text or an email, I'm too busy. Uh, I can't call you. I can't spend any time thinking about that relationship. How's that going to go over? Are we going to be best friends? Probably not. Do you think it's any different with your creator? If you don't have time to read what he's written to you, if you don't have time to talk to him, if you don't have time to develop godly relationships and be encouraged by fellow believers. Think about that. This is not to, uh, to condemn anyone. This is to encourage each one of us to do more and more as we seek God because we know that he is seeking after us. If you have a need that can be met tonight uh, by the, uh, the prayers of this group, please come forward while we stand and sing this song.